and I saw some message which was just really annoying. Someone just said some hateful stuff, racist something. Unrelenting Twitter abuse, but it was because I was a woman and because I was a Muslim. We wanted the non-Muslim community to see Muslims in a refreshing light. I love watching comedy. I go to comedy shows all the time. It's like the it's the best feeling. Who makes you laugh? A'uzu billahi shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Welcome to the Safi Bros podcast, available on all podcast platforms and YouTube. Alhamdulillah, we are doing it every second Friday at 3 p.m. So please subscribe so you can get the each episode as soon as possible. Um, inshallah, on this episode, we have an amazing brother. He is a comedian. He is very well known Muslim comedian. There he is there. <laughs> That's my website. <laughs> uh, it's his website. We have Nazim Hussain. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome Hello. to the Safi Bros Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks Thanks for having having me. me. It's, 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 been, it's been a tough uh, yeah. gig trying to get you on. Mashallah, you're very busy. Bro, uh, it's just, you know, I, I, I um, am just a lot of excuses. I've just been, just been <laughs> nervous about this. So I'm like, how do I I'm buy done. more time to prepare? <laughs> uh, guys, it took us like eight weeks here. So, like uh, Walid, we got him in two. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm at my own wake or something. Just like photos of my life. <laughs> so hey, about that, how would you like to be remembered at your wake? Oh, um, as someone that didn't know people money um, <laughs> and didn't go to jail for any serious crimes. Uh, I don't know. I just got, I'd like to be known as someone that, um, you know, when people hear my name, they're not like, I don't want to say, uh, mm. you know, people that didn't have bad, big bad things to say. You know, everybody makes mistakes, but yes. I just, um, I'd like people to not have severe grudges that they hold against me, yeah, you know, so someone that, you know, um, maybe brought uh, more good than bad to the world during my time. Inshallah, Allah um, but if not, you know, you guys can, oh, yeah, I'll give you my bank account details. You can use the rest of my cash to do good stuff. <laughs> How old are you now, Nazim? Um, well, 38. Sometimes on Wikipedia, it, it's like 47, 65, 21. Like people muck around with it all the time. And oh, now wow. that I've mentioned it, I'm sure it'll change again. Oh, so 38. 38, mashallah. Yeah. mashallah. How long have you been doing uh... comedy? Yeah. Or life? Oh yeah, comedy. Uh, well, since like, whew, like form... I left my office job in 2012, end of 2012, but I was sort of mucking around with comedy uh, 2005, six, seven, like 2007 was the first time I took part in a comedy show. That's when I did Raw Comedy, which is an open mic competition. You do five minutes of comedy. It's run by the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. Oh, wow. And there's heats, and then you get through the heats, you get through to the state final, and the national final was televised. Um, so that was the first time I did stand-up as stand up before that I was actually in the Muslim community, um, during community events, Muslim youth camps, kind of like your camps but run by YMA. Oh, wow. Um, Mashallah, you, you know, Mahmoud. Yeah, brother Mahmoud Kukchu yeah. and, um, and others, you know, so sometimes when like there'd be a quiz night or, you know, or the Sheikh was running late or there was like at nighttime, we'd have this thing called like infotainment or, you know, yes, there's Nazim yes. live. So I'd be the host and just cracking jokes about the day, oh, telling wow. stories and then like, Sister Monique Tui would come up and talk about psychology and having a healthy mindset. And then, you know, Brother Mahmoud would come up and talk about Islamic stuff. But I was wow. the guy just kind of keeping everybody laughing and interested um, oh, wow. late at night. So that was probably where I got my most stage time before I started doing comedy comedy. And then, oh, I, wow. yeah, then I entered. That was Pre Salam Cafe? Pre Salam Cafe. And then around that time, um, yeah, so Ramzi Nabulsi, yeah. uh, along with Waleed Ali, Susan Carland, Ahmed Imam, Ahmed Hassan. Um, they were coming, they were, they were coming up with this idea called Ramadan TV, which is the earliest incarnation of Salon Cafe. Yes. Um, it was four episodes. I think they filmed it. And then they approached me and said, oh, Hey, we're doing this thing called Salam Cafe. Would you like to be involved? I said, yeah, I just heard that Walid is going to be involved. And I was a massive fan of him, like of his, like we hadn't actually properly, met. I think I met him on a camp once. Wow. Um, and I was like, Oh, he's a guy that writes newspaper articles. You know, he's like. You know, he's a, he's a Muslim guy and he's a practicing Muslim and he's in this proper newspaper yeah, talking wow. about like Muslim life and stuff. And, and that was like groundbreaking for everybody. Yeah, and yeah, so, was, I, yeah. you know, and then as a nerd, like I related um, <laughs> to, to him. So, so when I met him and, I, and, and, and when the opportunity came to work alongside him and Ramsey, all these good people, I was like, yeah. Inshallah. Um, was why made the actual conduit? Was sort of like, actually when I- brought you together? Yeah, we were all kind of like, we all came up in a way, we, we were all connected to YMA in some way. Oh, wow. Uh, YMA is and was a great organization because it's sort of, everybody is an Australian Muslim, often mostly Australian born Muslims. Yes. yes. So it's not like we came with an, 
Islamic identity from somewhere else. Like we were all kind of figuring out what it means to be an Australian Muslim through this organization. Yes, that's correct. Um, so we had a similar sense of humor. We were all grappling with the same identity stuff. You go to school every day. People don't really get what you're doing. And then on Saturday during Madrasa, you know, 1 to 5 p.m., uh, we would kind of all be able to share a common – like we all get, we all got each other immediately. Yes. Like we got yeah. that weirdness, like that sort of double life. Yeah. Um, I love it. Yeah. It's so, yeah. It's so true. And so it was sort of during that, why, those YMA days, that's when 9-11 happened in year 11. When I started at YMA when I was in like year 7 and then year 11, 9-11 happened. And so we were all suddenly thrust into this same – predicament, you know, being Muslims, having to explain our beliefs. Um, and why am I kind of grappled with that pretty well? We were all sort of taught, listen, you know, you're all like ambassadors for the faith, which is a lot of responsibility to put on young kids. You've mm. all got to go out there, represent every time you do something, people are judging you. Um, and they're, and they think you of all Muslims based on how you interact with them. You <clears> might be the only Muslim they interact with. So we, we all really leveled up, um, it's you know, and now looking back on that same cohort, all those people I grew up with. They're all super successful, doing really well in life, um, socially very switched on. I think that sort of pressure really helped us understand yeah. who we are. And if we continued being Muslim or we continued wearing these identities, we were able to sort of internally and externally explain and understand those, oh, ideas, how they all kind of yeah. Yeah, subhanAllah, it's so true, together. mashallah. That's, powerful, isn't it? Yeah. That's what happens with us with the retreats because the people that come to the retreats uh, become more comfortable because they know each other. They don't have to explain themselves. They mm. don't have, and, and they fit and they go, wow, this just works, you know? Mm. And it's kind of like you guys yeah. are getting that every week. Like, yeah. like you said, it's like, where you been all my life? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's sort of, I used to go to like um, a Sunday school before that, um, uh, uh, like Isama. Um, <laughs> so that was like in, uh, in the sub, uh, Roville, Silverton Primary School. And that was fun, you know, but the teachers were great teachers, but they were also like, um, they were born overseas, often, mm. you know, Uncle Tiba, you know, like he, he was a, a beautiful man, but would sort of scare the kids. Like in a way that was like kind of good, you know, taught us a lot of stuff, but also didn't, wasn't like Australian, like we were born and raised. Yeah. Um, so it was until YMA, YMA really um, was, was special for a lot of us. So what were you doing before comedy? Oh man, I was like, so I went, you know, um, I was studying at uni, um, law and science. And then- um, Law and science? Mm, Wow. Um, Is that so, because mum and dad wanted you to become a oh, lawyer? No, you know, okay, this sounds like a job. Until 9-11, I wanted to be a pilot. That was genuinely what oh I wanted to be. God. Oh, wow. Um, I was raised by a single mum, you know, and my mum my used to like show us off to other people, go ask them what they want to be. And my older sister would say, I want to be a doctor so I can look after mum when she's sick. My younger sister would say, I want to be a lawyer so I can look after mum when she get, if she ever gets in trouble with the law. And I was like, I want to be a pilot so I can fly my mum around. Hello. Those are the three things. She's like, see? But, um, you know, my, my younger sister is the only one that sort of stuck to what she wanted to be, which is a lawyer. Um, but, yeah, after the pilot thing fell away after 9-11, I, wow. like, I was like, nah, there's no chance. I'm going to be hired That's as so a pilot. True, huh? How yeah. many Muslims would have actually pulled the pin on that career yeah. bar? Yeah, yeah. I mean, after pulling that. the pin is probably a bad... <laughs> 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 but, you know, oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> I was just like, no, I can't, I can't visualize it. This is your captain speaking. Nazim Muhammad Hussain. You know, sit back, relax. And, no, that's never going to fly. So, we're relax. not taking off. This is not <laughs> taking this off. dream is not going anywhere. Uh, um, so I grounded that. Uh, but, um, <laughs> so, yeah, then I, uh, yeah, I thought I'd be a lawyer because in my brain, I was like, lawyers change the world. You know, I don't even know, like I'd probably watch too many movies and I had this idea of law, that, that, that's human rights lawyers and standing up for, the... anyway, when I finished my last, last exam, I, I, I applied for a job at a professional services firm. There was one flyer on the, on the lunchroom table at the uni, picked it up, says, you don't need a commerce degree to work for us. And so I was like, I applied there, got the job and then just never bothered applying anywhere else. It was, so I was sort of working as a tax consultant, not even a lawyer, like a tax consultant, and it was sort of at the same time I was mucking around with comedy. So I was in a job that I wasn't even like planning on doing. Wow. And at the same time, because we're such a big firm, um, you know, I'd finish my work and then leave my jacket on my seat and run down the road, do a bit of ABC, a bit of comedy here or there. So my oh, comedy wow. stuff started taking off a little bit. And, and how long was the transition of going full time as a comedian? Yeah. So it was sort of, um, so it was one of those things. It was just a hobby on the side. Again, no intention to be a comedian. I was, I honestly thought I'll, I'll, commit to a proper job. Um, and this comedy thing was just something fun. Like Salam Cafe was fun. I started dabbling in stand-up as well. That was fun. Um, but then as you do more of that, like opportunities start coming to you. Like someone will come to you with an idea, do you want to do this role in this little show? Someone said, do you want to do Balls of Steel, which is that show where I pretend to be 
a bouncer or a lifeguard and all that stuff. And yes. so I was like, yeah. So I, so I took time off work to do that. And then TV producers saw that. And then the Sri Lanka face stuff they saw as well, which went on. And they, and they offered me my own television show. So again, I was working full time as a tax consultant. And then SBS came to me and said, would you like to do your own television show? And I was mm. like, oh, you know, it's not something that I've like planned on doing, but also I'm working full time. I don't know how my bosses are going to take it. So I went to, to the bosses at work. I said, listen, you know, I've been offered to do my own television show on SBS, but you know, I don't have to do it. I just thought I'd let you know, but you know, don't worry about it. I'll just say no, because you guys probably won't be able to give me that time off. Yeah. And they said, sorry, what? You, your own television show? I was like, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about it. I was really worried that I was going to upset them. And they said, listen, the corporate world is always going to be here. All right. Like Support. you've just been offered your own TV show. Like we're working in private clients where we're advising people to start their own businesses. Um, you know, and, and we we all know their stories, how they've started from nothing. Now they've come up with an idea, created a business. Like surely you've got to throw yourself into this. Otherwise we'd be hypocrites. Oh, wow. So they said, just do it, you know, see how you go wow. and come back. <laughs> and I thought, oh yeah, I'll, don't worry. I'll be back. I promise I'll be back. Anyway, I did the first season and then it just sort of rolled onto the second season and then things just got busy and I just never came back. But so, I, I always oh, thought man. I was going to come back. I just thought. But in hindsight, those guys are probably like, this is a good way to get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> He's not doing any work. But, um, That's amazing. But it, just sort of, it was sort of like, yeah, I felt very like, yeah, hesitant about doing it. Like I didn't tell my mom for a long time. I was sort of fibbing to her about doing comedy. You Why? Know? Uh, because I was, you know, like typical migrant story. They've come from, she left Sri Lanka um, for this better life that she couldn't have in Sri Lanka for us. You know, there's a typical, you know, she then got divorced. Um, raising us single-handedly, working all these multiple jobs, putting us through good schools in uni. You know, then I finally got this great job at an office. She's, you know, so happy to see me walk out of the house with a suit and tie. You know, he's not doing this comedy thing. That's just a hobby. He's a doctor. He's a, you know, he's a <laughs> lawyer, a doctor. You know, she's just loved that idea. And then suddenly I'm like becoming a full-time comedian, like giving, like that just, I just, wow. the thing is like, she took it better than I thought. Um, they, she was just worried about my financial security, but I, mm. I kind of got found out because she came to the office one day to drop off lunch and the receptionist was like, does anyone have worked here in months? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and then I was like, oh yeah. Anyway, so I used to um, go and do comedy during the day. And now, and now she's your biggest fan? Now she's my biggest fan. She comes to all the shows. Hello. Um, you know, she, um, for the Melbourne Comedy Festival, I do like 22 shows, um, 22, 24 shows. And she, she will often come to maybe 15 of these shows. And, oh, wow. and I'm like, just, don't, just come once. That's enough. You don't need to, you know, just relax. Um, she's like, no, no, no. Anyway, she's like, okay, I won't come. But sometimes I see her in the middle of the show, just sort of sneak in, but she's wearing like a very bright colored sari or shalvar kameez <laughs> and, you know, like <laughs> hijab with little, you know, gold bits on it. And so you can't miss it. You know, she's like, excuse me, excuse me. You know, I can see her walking through the crowd. Um, and so I'll make reference to her and then she, you know, like, um, She's so proud to see her son up on stage, oh, you know. Sure. Um, How much her. did that mean to you, her being there, seriously? Oh, the thing is like, um, yeah, we had a pretty tough, tough sort of upbringing, I guess. You know, single mum, uh, migrant, uh, you know, my mum would struggle to make ends meet for us and she worked very hard uh, and uh, did a great job, mashallah. Um, mashallah. So, you know, now our every success, we, uh, I would say a large, m the majority of that success, we are... Um, we attribute to her, like we would say, we, the, the pleasure in like getting anything or succeeding is that it makes my mom happy, makes her look good. She, yeah. you know, mm. she will, um, if I do anything on television, she'll spend half the day writing a press release on WhatsApp, just telling her friends like, you know, <laughs> my son is on TV, make sure you watch. Um, so she's very, you know, and it makes her feel good. So that's, um, Amazing. you know, it's, it's, it feels like that's the she's showing up is so powerful. Like yeah. we, we had the discussion this kind of day and yeah. like, just like, you know, just somebody, sh just the effort of a um, father or mother showing up mm. to something that you do mm. it just, is enough. Is enough for, you know, to make our world. Yeah, I think so. I think it's just sort of like the feeling of acceptance. Um, mm. And everybody wants to make their parents proud. Like that's the, um, I think that's, you know, it doesn't matter how much you have. If your parents, like nothing beats the pride of your own parents, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. that pat on the back, which is why, you know, there's also this other theory my manager has that um, all comedians, and she's worked with a lot of comedians, um, they all have some sort of issue with their dad. And so comedy is a way to fill that oh, wow. gap of validation. So, Subhanallah. you know, maybe I wouldn't be a comedian if my dad was present. <laughs> Subhanallah. So it is like, yeah, just showing up, um, I think, well, means that you're not going to have a comedian as a kid, but also it does do something to, to you, your wife. Are you the only boy? Yeah, I've got two sisters. Oh, wow. So I'm a middle so child. So you, you were doomed for destruction. 
Don't, yeah, I was yeah. Dirty boy. <laughs> Wendy boys always do. But my youngest sister is the funnier one in the family. Like oh, people well, uh. that, that have known us our whole lives are like, wait, you're the comedian? You know, she's the funny one. Subhanallah. You're, you're just the have you stolen of, any materials from her? She will come to shows and um, afterwards she's the most honest person. She'll say, yeah, that one was funny. That one wasn't funny. Like she'll just tell me straight so up. She's oh, your wow. shooter. Yeah, she's my shooter. She's like just brutal. You know, oh, I love it. That wasn't funny. I don't know why that was. No one laughed, and I don't think I was funny. Or she'll say something was funny and they didn't get it. Or you know, you got to tweak it. So she's she's like, um, she's my secret weapon. weapon. <laughs> I love it. I love it. When did when did you have a manager? When did you realize? Oh wow, I gotta. Well, it's sort of like it's one of these things again. It's um, uh, they all come, like I never sought a manager, um. When you start doing comedy, especially Australia, it's a pretty small community. Um, so if you're doing comedy, people will know. Well, I don't know a lot of the people that are just starting out, but once you start maybe doing well-ish, um, you know, it's a, it's a small enough community that people oh, know who's who. Okay. Um, so, yeah, when uh, me and this guy called Amir Rahman, um, we started doing comedy together uh, and we sold out a whole bunch of shows at the Melbourne Fringe. And then we had people come like – our old manager, Michael Lynch, he came to the show and he managed some pretty big acts and he was excited at what, what he saw. He was like, you know, we're new, but he could, you know, he could see what we were trying to do and we just need more stage time. And yeah, he basically, you know, it's like a handshake agreement. I'll be your manager. Oh, wow. Um, and then, so yeah, then his producer, so that's someone that puts on the live shows. She then became a manager afterwards. Um, she's, she's also a manager, but yeah, we're all sort of. Because you, because you hear a lot of stories, obviously the David Chappelle's and mm. people actually taking advantage of, of new you know, new blood, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot of blood there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so did you ever feel that in, in your industry? Did yeah. you ever feel, or is Australia more, more Australia supportive? Is pretty, Australia is a much, like we're lucky because it's, everybody knows everybody, which is probably the same in other countries, but Australia doesn't have that insane cutthroat kind of um, element to it. Uh, mm. You know, if you screw someone over, it's small enough that like, you're never going to not bump into them at the next event, you know? So at every, it, it's small enough that, so, and it's also like, it's different to other industries. Like, you can't really fake funny in a way. Like you're either, you know, you're either getting a laugh or you're not. You can hear it and see it. So, um, so from the, you know, it's not just about front and, um, I think you sort of have to prove yourself, but also like, yeah, if you screw someone over, it's going to get around and other comedians are not going to work with you. And yeah, but there are, having said that, there are people that are, you know, that are not, not very nice, but yeah, you've just got to, yeah, I don't know. I think you, you get advice from different people. Um, did you have that, that, that advice? Did you have that shooter? Yeah. So at all times, like, you know, I'll speak to like, uh, the thing is everybody's got advice. Uh, everyone has advice for you. Um, but I, but I've learned over time to take advice from people that like have always got your best interests at heart. Like mm. sometimes it's easy to take, you know, you can read negative comments online. You can, um, you can listen to people that only pump you up. Like yeah. that always say, yeah, 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 yeah. But they don't kind of like take into account the risk involved or, you know, they're just like, whatever, just do it, man. Stuff everybody else. You know, like the, the, they don't know how to maybe play the game or, mm. or, or understand the room. Um, oh, but people that like have your best interests and um, and that take the time to think and, um, and consider your situation properly, that one or those two people are like um, invalid. Like that, that is, yeah. the, the, their opinions are far more valuable than yeah. everybody else. Like Waleed's actually one of my, Waleed Ali is probably a, a, sure. a, a very um, important person in that regard. Like he's someone who, he's in entertainment, yeah. which is weird. You know, he's yeah, an entertainer. Yeah, he is. <laughs> he's an academic <laughs> yeah, and, mashallah, you know, yeah. uh, but he's, he's very entertaining. He's probably funnier than, he's done a comedy show with Charlie. But um, he's also Muslim, um, practicing Muslim, and he's uh, politically mind, like he, yeah. He's uh, so sure he's he's someone that we're very similar. We're in a very similar situation. Mm, so we're yeah. going at all times, kind of. How, how how was that? You're a trailblazer. No one's doing this. How does that feel? What, what take us through that? What, well, what was going on? Was the fame getting to your head? Oh, bro. The, you know? the, the thing is, like, um, when you're doing something new, uh, fame getting to your head is probably not the problem. It's probably the opposite. Like, um, when we first started out doing Salam Cafe, uh, and then also me doing stand up, uh, often what you just get or what you just take notice of is the criticism. Um, mm. We started Salon Cafe back when email was a big thing. You know, so people, we would get all these fan or emails to a fan account. People just telling us that like what we're doing is haram. Like, you know, women shouldn't be laughing. Uh, you know, there's too much free mix it. Like only criticisms. You're making Muslims look bad. Negative, 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 negative mm. from the community. Um, and that matters. That, that is, that, um, 
shakes you because it's coming from the people that you care about. So the criticism that is the most um, impactful is from people that you want to, or that you're, that you're, yeah, you want to impress, yeah, yeah. or that you want to like, you're siding with it. You're trying to like uplift them. So when they're upset with you, it's like, wait, what? No, that's what we do. We're trying to do. But we found like, so, so, so that's what, that's what sort of you're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of like understanding that and also understanding your own motivations and, and the advice that you've got from maybe scholars or like you understand your oh, intention wow. and then kind of balancing that and going, all right. But we did see a turn when like, um, the show probably reached a broader audience and we found that like, well, I found anyway that when it was like non-Muslims that liked us or the show and they would go to work and be like, oh mate, do you see that show Salam Cafe? Oh mate, those Muslims are hilarious. And then the Muslim colleague would be like, oh yeah, yeah, we've always loved them. I actually know them. And then that's, you know, so it's like they're waiting for like the validation of non-Muslims yeah, until they, and that's kind of like how we are as a community. We're often like very conscious of like how we're perceived externally um, before we will prop up our own. Yeah, um, right. Same thing we're in at the moment. Like yeah. the same, like we're 36 episodes in and same thing we, you know, we do like we've had the you know, comments, oh, you're, there's a sister with you two men in, in a single room. And mm. like, and now there's other people in here. There's, no, there's like other people sitting in these rooms. Not only our three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's haram. There's you know, a lot like, of, there's we, lot. We, you know, we've copped a lot of hate. You, know? you, you did uncle, mm. Uncle Sam. Yeah, Uncle Sam. That was yeah. that was the trailblazer because because a lot of a lot of the mm-hmm. you know I wouldn't call them hardliners but <laughs> the ones that really you know they were saying oh you are depicting our, our Dean with the yeah. beard and the gonna be yeah. yeah. and yeah. You, did you ever get threatened? Did you? Ever, oh, right. I, I do like to know. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. I'll t- the thing I'll, I'll say first up, um, you can never. Sometimes you just got to get used to, and this is someone who is a people pleaser. You've got to get used to disappointing people. Because you can't do something new and, and convince everybody that what you're doing is fine. If people are going to disagree with you, sometimes that's just it. They're going to have an opinion that is different to yours. And that's just the way the world works. So I mean, it's taken me even to today. I still can't get that concept clearly in my mind at times. Because emotionally you're like, no, no, no. They just don't get what I'm doing or they don't understand my position. No, they still, are, you know, they've got under, you know, sometimes you just got to just go, you know, whatever. That's, that's your opinion. This is mine. And this is. You know, leave it to God. But yeah, um, <laughs> Salam Cafe, Uncle Sam. Uh, I remember one time I, this is like, I mean, I, I landed once from, I can't remember where I was, I think Brisbane. I landed in Melbourne to go perform at the Eid Festival um, in Broadmeadows. And uh, I got yeah. a call from someone saying, hey, just to let you know, some guy wants to kill you. And I was like, what? And um, I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, something, something about Uncle Sam came into a pizza shop and said, where's his name? I want to kill him. Anyway, so then I had like a security guard meet me at the airport and take, and, you know, and, and accompanied me at the Eid Festival. Wow. Anyway, and fast forward, that guy then assaulted some other member of uh, Salon Cafe and ended up in jail for some other related wow. crime. But um, He was after you first. But the thing is, yeah, his guys, like, yeah. I can't, yeah, he was after me first, yeah. Like he had the security. Yeah, like I skipped, but like I've got, <laughs> now I've learned Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm, I'm a white belt. I've got one stripe. But um, <laughs> don't mess with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. If there is a mat and a supervisor <laughs> and a very a few specific moves I can do. <laughs> so, but, yeah, that. so it was like. How was that? Why didn't you give up? Why didn't you just say, what, what the hell am I doing? Um, because uh, maybe because of the arrogance of being younger. I was like, stuff this guy. But also, you know, if you. If you look at any comment on your, under anything I post, there's always a, a 10% negative comments. Um, and you sort of learn after a while that if you're doing anything that is um, not completely middle of the road, someone's going to be upset. I, I once made a joke about Vegemite on stage about like how, you know, like just, I was making fun of Vegemite. Even though I love Vegemite. Anyway, I got like some guy sending me threatening messages about, you know, wanting to hurt me because I made jokes about something very, very Australian, like Vegemite. I was like, firstly, it's not made in Australia. Secondly, like, how are you offended? I said all these other stuff. You're offended at Vegemite? Like, people are offended about everything. Wow. I, I, one time, um, some guy threatened to... <laughs> it's, it's like, people are just like... There is the public... I've, like, lost respect for uh, the public. Because <laughs> it's full of everybody, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. Just, like, you don't know who's listening to this right now. <laughs> And where they're watching oh, it. We need security. <laughs> exactly. <It's> security. <laughs> <laughs> you got this guy. <laughs> but um, uh, one time I had, we had this guy who um, I think is part of the Common Cheros. 
or he said he was part of the Comancheros and he wanted to shoot me and or Armour on stage while we we're performing in Sydney. He wrote that in some message. Wow. And so then we joked about that on air on Triple J and my manager was like, why'd you joke about that, you idiots? Now you've encouraged other people to do the same thing. So then they, they told the New South Wales police, we had a bodyguard look after us while we were uh, during the show. And this guy took his job way too seriously. He's a guy named Dragon, this big black guy with dreadlocks. And we were backstage and, he, and this guy was like walking up and down the aisle, looking at the crowd. And we were just peeking. And I remember he went up to these two Aussie guys who probably in his mind were like, these are the guys. And he went up to them and he, and he makes eyes with them and he goes, we're going to have a good time tonight, right? We're gonna, and he freaked the hell out of these guys. And I was like, what are you doing, Dragon? Like, just relax. <laughs> these are good people. But anyway, afterwards, he patted us down and, you know, patted everybody else down. So it was like, wow. th th this stuff happens all the time. <laughs> like, there's something about comedy. Oh, wow. Like, people get really passionate about it. Oh, wow. You see any new comedy on TV, Twitter, it's not just neutral or lukewarm. It's like, love it or hate it. Wow. Worst thing ever. So wow. everybody thinks they're funny. That's why. Subhanallah. Have you had any situations where like you went on stage and you said something and it's like dead silence? The, yeah, this happens all the time. And yeah? it's, and it's, um, you have to get used to it because it's actually with, with, with most other professions, you can make your mistakes backstage. No one sees them with comedy. You only know if a joke's funny when you're on stage telling it. So if you're not willing to get comfortable with the, the, the silence of failure when a joke doesn't work on stage, you're not going to be able to write new jokes. Wow. You have to constantly get used to like, but how do, like, I don't know. Like I would like freeze and buckle and go like this. Oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> it just, the only <laughs> thing experience has taught me is, is how to sort of hide it inside and make your face look like it's not, you're not crying on the inside. Wow. But really there's a lot of tears. In <laughs> have, you, have you ever been booed off? Um, I haven't been booed off, but there's this gig in, um, <laughs> in Edinburgh <laughs> called Late and Live, which is this sort of, no one really, so I got booked to do this gig. I didn't know it was what it was until I was doing it. It's this gig, historic, because Edinburgh is like the biggest comedy festival in the world, biggest fringe festival. I think the population of Edinburgh is like 600,000. During the fringe festival, it swells to like one and a half million people. Wow. So like a, a million people come in and out every week. Um, so the whole town gets taken over by like tourists. And so the locals, some of them get really pissed off. And so there's this gig called Late and Live. And so that's historically where the locals come and then they just, they just give it to the comedians. And it's just brutal. Um, and so I didn't know that. So I was there waiting to go on with my little clever political jokes or whatever it was. And so the MC was up there and I was like, listening to his jokes. I was like, oh, that sounds really like aggressive and sort of really bad. Just like, yeah, like pub ish material, just like really kind of lowbrow stuff, just yelling at them and being gross. I was like, okay. But that was sort of laughing. And then I went on and uh, I started doing my jokes. I started doing this setup and some guy just, some woman stands up and she just goes, oh, just be funny, would ya? And then some other goes, yeah, just tell us an effing joke. And then people just started, and I was like, what the hell's going on? And I didn't know, and they were yelling and throwing stuff. And so I just sort of yelled out my punchline over this crowd. And then I just said, thank you very much, put the mic, and just got off stage. I was like, what the hell just happened? Oh, wow. And like, oh, that's late in live, you idiot. Didn't you know that that's, you're supposed to like be really aggressive and just kind of like give it to the oh, audience. Wow. So yeah, it was, um. It was, and I, so I, I walked um, home from that gig with Armour and I remember saying to Armour, can, can I wear your jacket, please? Because I, I, I felt like genuinely that the whole crowd were wanting to kill me. Because like, <laughs> so I wore his jacket. I was like, they're going to, they're going to find me. They're going to join me. Subhanallah. <laughs> no, well, that's scary. So it's, it's, it's oh, still, wow. Yeah. That's it's, amazing. It's amazing. Like, yeah. just shows you different, different areas, different, you, yeah, you, you, it's, you, like, it's all experience, isn't it? Subhanallah. It's all, it's all, it's, yeah, it's all kind of, um, they're all, you know, war stories. Subhanallah. But it's like. It's sort of, yeah, there's no shortcut to comedy. It's, it's just about time on stage. You know, it's state, you can nothing, there's no substitute for stage time. You just have to like kind of yeah, earn your time on stage. Actually, I think in America, there's some sort of concept where like they say, you know, like, you know, how old are you? Which means like how many years have you been doing stand up? And if you're like 10, they're like, oh, well, you're, you're 10, you're, you're a kid. You mm. know, when you're 18, 20, then you're an adult and you're oh, worth man. listening to. Like, yeah, it's like, yeah. oh, okay. So you've been doing Experience, it for a while. Yeah. yeah it was, there's sort of no. Is that, is that why David Chappelle got better and better? He started, I think, when he was 14 or something. Wow. Um, you know, and the best comedians, like, the, 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 they've just, they've, you know, the 10,000 hour rule or um, it's kind of like acting. I don't know if you've ever done acting or have, you know, you've yes, got to walk yes. on camera. But they go, as soon as someone says action and they go, oh, you've got to walk down this corridor, suddenly you're like, how do I walk? You're hyper conscious of walking. You don't even know if you're walking like yourself. Yeah. And they go, like, Acting is all about like taking years and years to walk like yourself again. And comedy is the same thing. It's like taking years and years to be able to talk like yourself again on stage because you, um, you know, you're, it's almost like as soon as you're on stage, you, you become a different character and it's like, 
this is not really, you feel, you feel a bit out of your skin. SubhanAllah. Um, so because you do a lot, you've done a lot of TV now. I've done, t yeah, I've done TV, I've done stand-up. What, what have you done? What kind of just, if you do? Oh, like in Australia, like if you're a comedian, you do everything. You do oh, like, wow. you know, so you do, you, you do panel shows. So like where there's like a, it's like a game show or whatever, and you're a contestant and it's just, you know, question answer, but there's jokes um, or, 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 or sketches, you know, like um, Legally Brown was a show that I. That's right. That's right. You know, Orange is the New Brown. Or, and you've done the one, uh, what's it called? The one they take you out to Ireland. And oh, yeah. I'm a celebrity getting me out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That one there. It's um, right. So you sort of do everything, but um, yeah, so so you, you kind of are exposed to a lot of different um, sort of mediums. But yeah. Can, yeah, I, but, can yeah. I ask, you know, obviously, you know, David Chappelle's, you know, I love, I love his, mm. his stuff. And obviously we all know the story that he's lost $50 million for whatever. Have you ever been asked to compromise? Oh, like, can I ask that question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, like there's, um, like obviously you're mm. Muslim of faith and alhamdulillah you're practicing. I understand that. And alhamdulillah mm. you've got foundations for YMA. Mm. Have you ever been asked to compromise? Have well, you, have I you mean, felt like anyone's ever asked you to do something that you, doesn't line with your values? So, oh, like often, like, you know, when it comes to say press, um, you know, um, leading up to the tour, you know, so maybe like certain magazines might want to do like an interview with you. And, you know, if the magazine's probably not aligned with my values, we just got to say no, even though it might be good press for the show. Um, I once got asked to do this, this, um, like a, a new, a, a clothing label was launching in Australia and they offered to fly me to, to Japan <laughs> to just be there at the launch. And I remember it being like tens of thousands of dollars. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And I get to go to Japan. And then I like, Googled the company. I was like, oh, they don't really have ethical um, manufacturing standards. So they, I think they, it was dubious as to whether they use child labor. So I was like, got to turn it down. But the thing is, like, I thought it would hurt more than it did. But it actually was like, as soon as it doesn't align, you're just like, I can't do it. Just kind of like if someone goes, here's a pork sandwich. As Muslims, like, you know, it's almost just like, oh, yeah, no. Nah. You just, yeah. it's not even a question. Yeah. Um, so you'll surprise yourself with how kind of easy it is to. Yeah. Because I remember bumping, no. in, bumping into you at Falls Festival in Tassie, if you remember. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Ice Cube was back there, if you oh, remember. Oh, man, I remember that. Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were like, what are you doing here? That was so <laughs> like, weird. I'm doing the catering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, remember because, that. Because we were watching the shows of Hanla. Yeah, yeah. Was, and Ronnie Cheng was there as well. Yeah. Um, that was, subhanallah, how you bumped into people. Oh, the, the thing with comedy, like, the, um, like, I think a lot of people might be like, oh, you're probably compromising a lot, uh, you know, because comedy is often in pubs or at places where people are just, like, you know, getting smashed. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of, yeah, so that's sort of almost like a constant um, kind of compromise, I guess yeah. I make. It's sort of the workplace. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, but when I put on my own shows. Um, you can control you know, that. Yeah, you can have some control over those sorts of things. But, yeah. but yeah, that's almost like the gym to work out your material. You have to be in comedy venues. And so. mm. I want to touch base on your young days. Yeah. So, yeah, just go take us through primary school, high school. Yeah. Tell us about that. You know, were you, you in, where were you? Oh, so I grew up in, um. Uh, Burwood. Burwood? Road. Yeah, eastern suburbs. Oh, no. I oh, know. You guys are the north, mate. <laughs> yeah, that's, I know. That's a divide. Completely <laughs> <laughs> divide. Yeah. Different How people. was that? How was that? Oh, it's um, yeah, it's like very – so I got, went to Ashburton Primary School. Um, So my parents at the time, when, when, you know, when they came to Australia in the 70s, they were either going to live in – so they, they chose between Burwood or Springvale or Clayton or something like that. And Springvale, Clayton is like a very – those are very ethnic suburbs. A lot of Asians, that's a lot right. of Sri Lankans, Indians. Or build, which is like very white, middle class. Mm. Um, and I think it was like $4,000 difference in the price, but they went to build. So the property value now is really different, but they chose so like the this, this suburb, which is, yeah, anyway. So we're, we're there and, um, uh, you know, as I said, single mum from when I was about six, local primary school. Uh, How was that being no father? Oh, it's, um, nah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, look, it's, it's, uh, well, now as a and dad. No brother. That's, that's no thing. brothers. Um, you know, my mom did an exceptional job in like making sure that I did have, uh, male role models, which I now understand how important that is. But growing up without a dad, you definitely feel it. Um, there was a time when I kind of lied to my school friends about like my dad being at home. Oh yeah, yeah. He's, he's at home or he's just gone on a holiday. There was a real shame around and maybe it was a shame, but also just like a, uh, like there is a real emptiness about not having your dad around. It's, um, yeah, it's not, it wasn't, it wasn't easy as a kid. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, my mum made sure I went to, and also my sisters went to girl guides and we had a lot of community people around. Allah. Um, you know, we had this Pakistani uncle who taught me to read Quran or taught all of us, but he also like took it under, you know, it was, he, he sort of, it was his responsibility in a way to like make sure I learned how to drive, ride a bike, swim. Like he was, 
he Amazing. sort of became, a, in a way, like... Um, Did you have extended family here? Did your mum have No, so, so they were all, like, in Sri Lanka or, like, Whoa. London. Um, but, yeah, so it, was, so it was kind of an isolating experience, particularly for my mum. Like, she was there doing it all by herself. We had a Sri Lanka Muslim community in Australia, but um, I would say in those days there was probably more of a stigma around being a divorced woman. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, all of our sort of qual- all of our good qualities and... I probably come from my mum, who is a very strong woman. I love that um, too. You know, awesome. you know, as a, as a single brown Muslim woman in Australia, she wasn't scared to just tell anyone where it's at. Um, not afraid of anybody. So, um, yeah, uh, did, did a very good job. Make sure we made sure we studied very hard. But oh. yeah, you know, we always one one thing one thing that I think we learned through all that those challenges. Um, and you know, this is not a unique story for um, migrants or Muslims. Is is that there is there are always people that are doing uh, l- less well than you, as a, you know, they're doing worse than you. Um, mm. So she always made sure we were volunteering, you know, whether at the nursing home or doing, you know, volunteer work at YMA or at the mosque, or we were just always um, donating whatever, whatever little stuff we had, we would be. Um, Gratitude. Magic of giving back. Yeah. Mm. And, it, and it does kind of make you, um, you know, look forward because otherwise you can kind of, sit and dwell a little um, yeah. and not make the most of your opportunities. So, yeah, it was – I think it actually did help develop our character pretty quick. Any uh, tough moments at school that you – Oh, like school was, you had to learn jiu-jitsu? <laughs> oh, one, I mean, one time some guy was being – like, and I remember, like, I had a very fast tongue. I still do. But uh, I said something to him and he started chasing me. He was being racist. And, I, and then I ran and then he couldn't catch me. So he punched my friend in the face. And then, he, and then anyway, he got suspended – both of my friend and that guy got suspended and um, the teacher was like, you know, you better watch out. This guy keeps wanting to fight you. And I don't know why they didn't just tell him to not want to fight me, but they were like, yeah, you, you just better watch out at all times. So I was just constantly, so this is in year seven and eight, I went to Mount Waverley Secondary College. Wow. Um, but then I got a- Just racism at its best. Just, yeah, it was just like, uh, it was a different, yeah, it was a very different time. Like my mum, one, one time my older sister, she, you know, she was copying some racism from some kid um, and, uh, you know, the school didn't really do much about it. We were like one of the only ethnic families at the school. Wow. Everybody else was just white. Peter, it's like a Peter Costello <laughs> seat. Like that was how, you know, sort of blue ribbon. The summer. <laughs> so my mum told the principal, the teachers, nothing happened. The principal actually told my mum, you know, I think you're just imagining it. You're probably overstating it. Kids will just figure it out themselves. And it turns out that the principal used to play tennis with that bully's mum. So she was just like not very interested in so my mum went to the local MP's office, who was at the time Jeff Kennett, and he was a premier of Victoria at the time. And she went in and the receptionist said, can I help you? And my mum said, I want to speak to Jeff. And she says, sorry, who are you? Do you have an appointment? And my mum just walked past her, went straight into Jeff Kennett's office and said, Jeff, you need to do something. But I don't know what she said. It was like 45 minute chat. And then an hour later, my mum walked back into the principal's office with Jeff Kennett by her side. Oh, oh, no. wow. And Jeff Kennett said, listen, just do whatever this lady says. <laughs> and uh, the bullying sort of stopped. So that was kind of how I'm um, alone. Wow. You know, so she was, just, she was wow. a bit of a gangster. So, uh, you know, like, Jeff, you come with me you know, right now. So I don't know how she bullied. Now, this is a guy Why did she have her security instead of oh, no. what's oh. his name? Skull. Oh, no, 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 dragon. dragon. But she just, like, I remember one time, like, my sister was getting picked on by some kid. You know? so, that's one thing I'm going to touch on. It's mm. very important. Mm. The power of complaining Complains. and going to these local and federal MPs, Ooh. they must do something about they it. They represent us. They yeah, represent yeah. Well, us. we're paying their bills. Well, they represent us and we understand. fail to lean on them to represent us. Yeah, I think you know what it is. It's like the it's a typical migrant thing. You know, like whenever you go to like mosques or community groups and an MP will come and everyone's like, oh, the, pre- oh, the MP's here and they'll treat them like VIPs. Are so grateful that you are here. Like it's because it's in our old countries, you know, like yeah, they're like yeah, dictators yeah. and you don't mess with them. Otherwise they'll, you know, steal your property or something. <laughs> but, you know, or take your yeah, car. I'll take your car, all that sort of stuff. Or your sister. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but, you know, like here we just got to like, we've got to, yeah, we've got to lean on them. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's one of the big biggest failures in the Muslim community that we fail mm. to lean on them mm. when we need help, like yeah. honest. Help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's literally and, how and, the system works. We're yeah. supposed to. Yeah. But, and know. she took him to the principal. She took him to the principal's office, you know. Um, oh, we wish I could get that just, photo. I know, well, actually, I've got a photo with him when I was at, um, oh, like I got a photo with him at like an Anzac Day parade. I was like a, maybe a nine-year-old or something. And you told him the story? Uh, I don't think I told him the story, but I think he's heard the story once. 
Um, oh, wow. like, yeah, but um, but you know that that's kind of how my mum used to think. Like just so whatever. Know. One time, this other kid was teasing my my younger sister, and my, my and my sister told my mum, and my mum was like, "Okay, what's his name?" You know, his name was something something Vickers, and so my mum was like, "Hmm, okay, go to school tomorrow and tell everyone, hey, hey, I don't want to say his name, something something Vickers, <laughs> forgot his knickers." <laughs> And then, and then so, my, so my sister said that to some kid at school, it caught on and everyone started saying that phrase and, and, and then that bullying just stopped. Like, Allah. just, just she, she Is that the funny around. sister? That's the funny sister. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> the early training. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she, she, or another time, like, uh, some kid was teasing me and I didn't, I accidentally told my mum. And then for a week, the bullying had stopped. I didn't know what was going on. I was like, how come the bullies are being nice to me? Friday afternoon at the end of that week, school finished. I walked towards the gate and my mum's there. Standing, she, she didn't know I could see her. She was standing there with a bunch of bullies from the year level above me in year eight, and they were holding like chocolates and lollies in their hands. So she had bribed that group of bullies oh, to keep wow. the younger group of bullies off my back. That's wow. how, you know, she's a gangster. Oh, oh, you know? <laughs> she's <laughs> like, so she just, she knows how to, <laughs> she just gets Now I know done. why he got four, into comedy. Four. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> four kids, correct? Three kids. Three, three kids. kids. Yeah. Yeah. Two girls yeah. and a boy here. Yeah. So, by herself. Allah. Mashallah, man. Amazing. Yeah, so, you know, that's how I'm going to parent my kids now. <laughs> <laughs> AK-47. <laughs> I know, exactly. I'll take care of business. <laughs> Subhanallah. High yeah. school, same? So, so, so year seven and eight was, that was kind of a bit, you know, it was, it was a dodgy school. It was a good school. Like the teachers tried, but the kids were just like sometimes not interested. Kind of famous for marijuana, apparently. Mm. Remember those, those chain emails? Mm. About... No sport. But then year nine, I went to Melbourne High. Oh, uh, so I did that state Melbourne school High. in the city. You know, state school, but yeah. private school education. Yeah, yeah, top end of town. That bunch one. end of nerd. How did you get in there? So you do an exam, and then they take like they take the top three percent of people that do that. They you know you get in so. It's just like one third Asians, one third curries, what we'd say, and then one third skips and, and, and walks, you know? Wow. So like that was a sort of racial mix and everyone there was excited about learning. You know, it was like, mm. you didn't, it was, it, it was uncool to it's learn. Environment, yeah, it was yeah. environment. And we were just like, it was cool to do well. And I just loved that. It was just the best for me. I couldn't get in there. I was just around the corner, St. Jazz, yeah, North Melbourne. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, <laughs> do you know what? You got to, you can game the tests, you know. Good, do you good. think that changed you? Oh, absolutely. It's just like um to this day like those are the those are the best four years of my schooling. Probably four years, four of the best years of my life. Like it was everyone like we all love every time I meet another Melbourne High guy, we just always get really excited talking about our school days because, oh, you know, we used to hang out with the teachers. Like I've gone back to speak a bunch of times and teachers are still like, they could work at any other school, yeah. but imagine teaching to a bunch of kids that are excited about being there. Wow. It is, it is a real luxury, it is. but um, yeah. it's not it's, normal. Everyone speaks so highly of their schools. But it's, but, uh, but I think you can kind of, what it is, is like, um, being, being around people that are excited about the same things. Yeah. If you're yeah. around people that are not excited about what you're excited about, it really, it's like a, it's just yeah, a totally. same as me when I, like when I went to a private, and the state school. I yeah. went to Faulkner High. Oh, yeah. Mm. And Faulkner High was like, everyone went to punch on and yeah. do the you know, stupidest things ever. And when I went to St. Joe's, North Melbourne, everyone was excited about education. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm, so like everyone sense. was a nerd like me. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, fit, I fit it extremely well. Yeah. So it was different. Yeah, it's kind of like, because then you're not like pushing, you're not like, because you're trying to figure out your identity. Everybody wants to fit in. And if fitting in means doing something that you don't want to do, well, then you're going to change who you are. Yeah. You know, mm. um, what would be the most difficult uh, situation in your life that uh, you felt like giving up? Or? Probably, I mean, comedy is a real challenging one, especially like in those early days when you're copying a lot of criticism, um, you know, and you're, you know, criticism sounds like it's easy to take when you just go, oh, don't listen to the haters, haters going to hate. Um, but when it comes from people, like I said, that you care about, um, oh you know, so yeah, it was those emails and like people kind of, uh, people that you sort of respect, um, misreading your intentions. And when people don't see or believe or understand what you are trying to do, it makes you, it can make you doubt yourself, but it wasn't until you, uh, you surround yourself with people that, um, that you love and that trust you. And also when you, um, can start to see the benefits of your work. So, you know, so, sometimes I will, like, it's always the emails and the messages you get from people, um, that you don't expect. So like, you know, I, I opened up my inbox the other day and, you know, someone who said, Hey, um, you know, my partner passed away and he really used to love watching your comedy. It used to make him laugh, especially when he was sick in hospital. Um, and so it's those sorts of things that I'm like, Oh, that's really nice. You know, someone who's unwell got to have a laugh because of my work or, or someone saying, you know, really, you know, I just received a message today from someone on 
TikTok who's got like over a, a million followers and he's a young kid, but he, um, he said, you know, uh, uh, he got to, I met him the other day and he said, I was really excited to meet you. You know, you say what you think and I would love to do that one day, but I'm quite scared to do it. You know, you inspire mm-hmm. me. And, um, and I, that makes me feel really good because it's like, oh, for me, it's like, I don't know any other way, but to say what I think, like I kind of, sure. I don't know how to be neutral. So it's kind of like a natural, but also like, it's nice to know that because you know, I always, everybody's in, I'm inspired by other people. So to, and I know how that feels to be inspired, Shalom, but it's yeah. not like I'm trying to be inspiring, but merely doing something in a, yeah. in a public way has that effect. Yeah, um, so. so that means something that, you know, it's those sorts of, those sorts of messages that um, feel special. It's amazing. Like it, same as us. I think everybody is inspired by, yeah. by letters. Like it's like us, you know, same mm. thing with like the letters that we've got and messages that we get. Yeah. 100%. Even, even lives, the guests mm, that come in, they inspire get. us saying, we got to do more. we got to do more. Oh, well, this is the thing. Like, uh, you know, you've, you, before this interview started, you were talking to me and saying, oh, you've been doing this for a long time. But, and, the, and, but I actually feel like I am, it sounds like I'm just getting, like, I'm not trying to be motivated. I feel like I'm just getting started. Like I feel very wow. new and I'm like, all right, you know, I'm, I now think I know what I want to do. Like, I, like I've like i just started. I feel, still feel like a newcomer. Um, so, yeah, you know, sometimes yeah, when people talk about me like, oh, you've been doing it for a while. I'm like, no, I haven't. I'm just, I'm literally just starting. Um, oh, so yeah, there's always like a, a long road ahead. We, we got a message today. Somebody saying, yeah. what, what did he say? Dan? He, he said to us, he's known us for a long time. And he goes, this is the most inspiring thing you've done. <laughs> and, we're yeah. like, and we're like, and we looked at each other and said, Alhamdulillah. Like, he's, he's, he's known us for a long time. time he's seen he's a lot of the work we've done. done yeah. And then, and then he goes, most like, impactful, most impactful thing you've ever done. Yeah. yeah. Well, things like, like uh, when I listen to, yeah, like you, you know, I, I really like learning about, you know, it's always, you always see the very public stuff that people do, but actually like getting to know the person, yeah. Yeah. you realize that everybody is just another person and we're all born with the same sorts of yeah. abilities. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. We all have the abilities, but, I think a lot of us have taken different roads and mm. different, you know. Everyone's got different superpowers. Yeah, there's, there's different superpowers. Mm-hmm. Mashallah, like, you know, like, mashallah, like you said, you've always had a fast hunt, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, fast yeah. mind, so you, you're quick yeah. quick to react, mm. which is, makes, makes you prime for comedy, really. You're, you know, you're prime for that. Mm. Compared to somebody else who's a lot slower thinker like myself who can, is to sort of think <laughs> deeply about something before he talks, uh, you know? You know well, no, that, I mean, that's probably a, a plus. Like, you know, I probably wouldn't be suited to the law because... I would be saying things and then trying to take it back. <laughs> like, sorry, your honor, retract all that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think before I, um, I, so I, I, I talk and then I think. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? But actually that reminds me. So you had Susan Carlin on as a guest and Susan, Michelle like Susan is another one of those people who, oh my God, Dr. Allah. Susan Carlin. Um, yes. But she's incredibly inspiring. Actually, she's someone who is, she, she talks quick, but she somehow manages to think before she talks. Like oh, she's yeah, so yeah. sharp. <laughs> Mashallah, like we had amazing yeah. dialogue and oh. she was, well, she, she Oh, she's just like, you know, constantly, in fact, when I do comedy at my show, sometimes when I'm trying to figure out if a joke is acceptable or unacceptable or whether it's crossing the, I actually imagine Sister Sarah Sabah and Susan Cullen in the crowd and how they might react. Oh, wow. That's actually my litmus test. I'm like, oh, oh no, nah, I shouldn't do that joke. But one time actually, like, she cops, you know, she turns, she cops a lot of criticism as well. And oh, my God. Sometimes, yeah. you know, but, she, but when she. The biggest hate we have copped on our Instagram mm. and a TikTok page it was hers. It was hers. Mm. We, I, I, I think I deleted something like 600. Wow. 600 Just comments. Absolute. Just well, disgusting ruthless stuff. Ruthless stuff. Disgusting stuff. Mm. And despite that, like she's still kind of, um, so she's, she's someone who is like, she does, she, it's not like she's Teflon. Like she, yeah. that all affects her personally. Of course. But it's also, but she still has such a strong conviction in, like doing the right thing that she will still yeah. push through that. And I was rebutting everyone saying, guys, watch the podcast, mm. understand her story, and then come back and make some commentary. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? But everyone wants to judge without even knowing the reality of the situation. Yeah. There's so much hate. Well, I mean, this is the thing, like people make judgments before they know the person. And I would say, I know them very well personally. I've known them for years. And Susan will lead of everybody that I know has, like they've both never lied. They ask, there are two people that like, do what they say. They are not one person in front of the camera and another, but like they are the most consistent. Like, so I, so you know, with, with my friends, I talk so much junk and, you know, I'm an idiot, but like they are always consistently. But I remember what, so, so she, so she's someone that costs way more heat than I do and way more heat than I reckon Waleed does. And he's very public. Yes. Yeah. She's a woman, etc. Um, She gives a dollar every time someone sends her a hate, yeah. hate tweet. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. But I remember one time she said, you know, um, 
I think the the sunnah is, or maybe it's in the Quran, like every time someone sends you or says hate to you, respond with peace. Like mm, that's yes. actually the, the Islamic tradition. Yes, exactly. So, so I remember like, you know, uh, I think it was maybe that night I was on Facebook and sometimes I check the inbox and it's just like, sometimes it's just full of junk. And I saw some message, which was just really annoying. Someone just said some hateful stuff, racist something. And I was just about to go, you know, I was about to screenshot it. Or I think he said a threat. But, you know, I was like, you know what? I'll just do what Susan said. I just thought just as a joke to almost troll him. So I just said something like, hey, bro, peace. May peace be with you or something, something. Anyway, two days later, he replied saying something like, oh, hey. Um, and I said, hope you're well, bro. And he said, well, actually, I've um, been having a, a rough time. And then I said, well, you know, look after yourself. Take some time out. You know, um, we always need time out or something, something nice to that effect. Oh, and I was just trying to channel Susan. Like literally I was angry, but I was just, I'll just channel Susan. A couple of days later, that guy messages me going, Hey, thank you so much for your messages the other day. Um, if you if it wasn't for your messages, I'll read, I'll, I'll send them to you after. Um, I was going to kill myself. Oh. Like literally. And I was like, what? And it wasn't like, I'm not saying I'm a good guy. I was only literally doing that because of Susan's kind of advice. And I just thought I'd do it almost just dis, despite myself. And I was like, and I kind of understand like, Wow. I get the wisdom wow. behind. Wow, we got we got to get those messages. Yeah. Oh, another, we we there, got to put it on the podcast. You got to send it. There's another guy who I won't tell you. Like this is a guy who I'm now f friends with in a way. He he actually I posted some clip and he then um he then he I think he threatened to shoot me and I said and I basically replied saying sorry what and then and he said I said it again and I almost like was wanting to get him to admit to his threat so I had it as a screenshot because I was just like fed up. And then, I'll, and then he, you know, he goes, you always make a fun of Aussies. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I don't hate all. Anyway, I ended up just calling him. You know, like you can call on Messenger. Yes. And he picked up and I, and I was like, bro, what's with your message, man? That's really aggressive and quite violent. And then he said, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm just kind of a, listen, man, I'm having a bad day. I'm like, look, I'm a, I was having a good day until I got your message. And like, I'm actually just trying to make people. And we had this like chat and he goes, look, I'm really sorry. I'm like, look, I'm sorry, child. I don't really mean for my comedy to upset people. It really upsets me when someone gets upset by my comedy. And we then had a chat. And I swear to God, by the end of the cat chat, you know, we found out we both do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's like, why don't you come down to my gym? He lives up in the country. I was like, oh, well, I'm in Melbourne. He goes, oh, well, which gym do you go to? And at that point, I was still a bit suspicious. So I told him another gym. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, yeah. Just in case. <laughs> Just in case. Just want to kill me. But anyway, we kind of been in touch. I've sent him some of my book. He sent me some, like, we've, we're actually friends. Allah. And I started out from this, like, kind I want to kill you. Kind of, but, but I think it, someone that's messaging a random person on the internet has something that they're upset about in their own life. Like there wasn't, mm. like, they're, he's they're, not, they're only projecting what's happening in their life in reality. Yeah. And that's the thing, like you're a fleeting thought in their brain, but the person that receives it, you will fixate on that for hours. Yeah. Like you, like that's, that's something that you will think about. Yeah. Um, I've, I've had a similar circumstances when we opened Dr. Donuts yeah. and I had the Victorian champion, barista champion that used to work at Padres come mm -hmm. and support me and teach me how to do coffee. I don't know how to do coffee. Right. He stayed with me for six days. Yeah. And I had a customer because we opened up at six o'clock, 6 a.m. in the morning and I had a customer come every morning and order his coffee and it was the rudest. Really? And I'm talking about rude. Like the, the third day he slammed the money on the counter and says, give me my coffee. That bad. And I'm looking and I'm thinking and, and and the Brewster chamber is saying, how are you putting up with this? Is this the North? Is this what, is this what, you, <laughs> is this kind of the other side? Yeah. Whoa, 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 <laughs> and he's like, like <laughs> and, and he's like, is this what you expect in the North as service? I'm like, probably he's having a bad day. You know, every time I tell you, I'll make an excuse yeah. for him, you know, the third day after I gave him coffee, he goes, you need to come outside. I need to talk to you. And he's like, are you going to go outside? You're going to get out of the, <laughs> out of the shop? I go, yeah, see what what's his problem. Yeah. I go out and he's put his coffee on the counter. He starts hugging me and crying. I'm like, what's wrong with you? Whoa. He goes, bro, three days ago, he goes, I caught my wife cheating on with my oh. best friend. And I've been taking out it for the past four days. I'm sorry. I just mm. want to tell you, thank you for not losing it at me. And I'm like, and I'll start crying. And the Bristol guy's oh. like, what's wrong with these blokes? And I'm like, you, and that's when I, the penny mm. really dropped. You just don't know what people are going through. You know, uh, you're absolutely right. Like that is, that's a full on, that's a beautiful story. But also that just shows you how, like, how close we are to tipping someone over the edge, but also like, it's a real opportunity. Yeah. Actually, I told my manager that story about the guy who was going to suicide. And she said, <laughs> send those screenshots to Ursula, like one of this other comedian, Ursula oh, Carson, wow. one of my best friends as well. She's, she's someone who like, when someone, it's good quality as well. If someone criticizes her or is mean, she'll go at them. Like she doesn't take it. Oh. She also stands up for me in the same way. Like 
you pick on Nazim, you're effing racist, da 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 Like, she's like a oh, gay wow. woman who just doesn't, just she's bang. loyal as hell. But also, like, at the same time, you don't know what's going on you in that person's know. life. You don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, but it is, it is like, just to your list, just try it as an experiment, like, literally like I did, because it's just interesting, if anything. Like, only bad can come from you going at the person. You might feel good for a moment, but I think it can, it's only going to end in an, it can only go in a bad way. But if you try, if you respond nicely, like it might confuse them, but it could actually, it's yeah. actually just like, yeah, I try to do that actively now because it, it's against what I'm used to. Especially Hello. in comedy, like someone yeah. says something mean on stage, like heckles you, you want to give it back, make a yeah. laugh out of it. Yeah. But Amazing. Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran, وَلَا إِجَازِ إِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ So only the reward for excellence or إِحْسَانِ Perfection is perfection. So mm. when you give somebody that, it's, it's reward and it's return is always mm. of that caliber. So it's, oh, it this also, this, this yeah. is the Muslim's way in reality. It's also like the, you know, the neighbor that used to throw junk over the fence. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, so, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's, yeah, but that's, so I attribute that to Susan, you know, definitely <laughs> inspiring. But isn't it amazing? Like the, the, the people we surround ourselves with mm. cause an environment that mm. gives us comfort and mm. growth. Because yeah. we, you couldn't have done it without these people, honestly. No, like if you think so. about it, we break. Mm. We can't. We just we can't make it by ourselves. We need an community, environment. Yeah. We need yeah, we community. Need village. Yeah. We need that village. And, yeah, you know, as so. I say, you know, it, it takes it takes a tribe. That's it is also like a you know like uh, it is an ego thing to not have a village around you. Like to be, like, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, and that's mm. kind of me in a way. Like I like to do things my way. I just you just I just like to know what I'm doing. I don't need to listen to. But actually, like having people around you. You don't have to take their advice, but just listen. You never know what you might take. That's good. You you, you know. Yeah. Um, oh, that that is the best advice I can give our brothers and sisters. Wallahi, it's, it's your environment and you surround with. Yeah. Like if you find brothers and sisters, which even though, like even if you're angry, whatever it is, Allah, whatever you're going mm. through, just have those people around you. Just listen to them. Sometimes mm. it might not affect you, but at least. Keep mm. yourself surrounded by them. Mm. So, subhanallah, sooner or later the, the penny drops. Subhanallah. And we have so many kids, especially within our own business, that yeah, we talk about just environment. and Yeah, you just never friendship. know. Like, you know, 99 times out of 100, you know, that village isn't going to improve your business or your idea. But it's that one time when you don't expect it or when you're just stuck on something that someone might say something or you, know, might, you, you might remember something that this good village around you is inspired mm. and then that'll... I, I, I can say, like, honestly, I remember when you first started, I can't, I can say, like, the Muslim community was quite behind you. Like, you were, I remember going to your shows, mm. and it was, when I looked around, it was like, mm. mainly, it was mostly Muslims. Yeah. There, was, there wasn't, like, I'm saying, but on a majority yes, yeah. perspective. Yeah. And, that, and that's your village in a way at the start, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Oh, and if I don't have that village, I feel like I've lost my way. So, you know, um, yeah, I, that's almost like naturally who I play to, but what I've seen is that, like, now, non-Muslims. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. seen that, yeah, now. Like, yeah, and, it's, and if I didn't have that, um, which is why I'm saying like, that sometimes if the criticism comes from your village, that's the stuff that it means hurts, most. Yeah. We've got such a big village, actually. So yeah, We do, yeah, we do. Yeah. It's a diverse village. It's a diverse village, and that's, you know. Because you've got the Turks, you've got the Albanians, you've got, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they're all there. You know? SubhanAllah. But yeah, you've got to find your people. Um, and mashallah, I can say like, I can say like, you know, because we, I've been following you since the start, mashallah. <laughs> And mashallah, like, you know, it's watching yeah, you evolve. Uh, uh, watching you evolve uh, through the community. Oh evolve yeah. or devolve. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Amazing. I was, I was ashamed that you didn't get the Will Smith thing happen to you. That's all. <laughs> oh, bro. Oh, my gosh. Well, I actually just hosted this thing called the GQ Man of the Year Awards, and his daughter was in the crowd. And when I was starting the show, she started kind of standing up and heckling me. In this, and the one... Directive I got was don't make fun of Will Smith's daughter. So all I was thinking of was, oh, what do I say? Because oh, like, wow. she's, anyway, you know, because I thought, you know, you, you, all you want to say is, you know, <laughs> oh wow, daughter of who would have thought the daughter of Will Smith would interrupt the host of an awards show? <laughs> but you can't, you know. <laughs> so so, but no, um, <laughs> I, I've been slapped in the face. I have been punched in the face though. I did balls of steel, and I was uh, a bouncer. Um, and some guy punched me in the face nah. and uh, they didn't have a bouncer for me. They didn't have a bodyguard for me. Afterwards, they hired a bodyguard for me. And this bodyguard was an ex-sergeant of Victoria Police. And uh, one time we were waiting for a shot to get set up outside Luna Park. And uh, he said, remember when that Ferris wheel fell off? Remember years ago it fell off? And, and I was like, yeah. He goes, yeah, and people died. I was like, oh, my God, yeah. He goes, I was on duty at the time. I said, oh, whoa, what the hell did you do? He goes, I looked at my partner and I said, mate, there's two months of paperwork in that. And we just drove off. And I was like, what the? And that was a guy. He was protecting my life. 
So, you know. He's not going to do the paperwork for you. He's not going to do you. jack for me. Yeah, exactly. He drove off. He drove off. It's off. your hard basket. Get out of here. Exactly. <laughs> oh my God, so I feel a lot of confidence. Oh, wow. Oh, you got to love that, man. <laughs> oh, that's a funny one. Oh, so wow. tell, tell us what would be your happiest moment. Happiest moments are with family, you know, um, just with my family, friends. Just like I love, like I love just having time with my kids, um, my H- wife. How many you have? Got Mashallah. two kids. Mashallah. Um, boy, girl. A boy and a girl. Mashallah. Nearly six, nearly two. Um, Isa and Amina. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing better than that, you know. Like often when they're do, they're being cute, I pull the phone out and start recording. Uh, but we, it's when you put the phone away and you're yeah, just like in, in the, the moment. moment. Yeah, yeah. I know it's cliche, but it's. Those are the sorts of, um, that's the stuff that is, makes me most happy. And also just like having a good gig. It's nothing like it. Like as a stand up, TV, all that stuff is fun, but live shows when the crowd, when you're, when you're, you're in a good rhythm and the crowd's laughing and it's one big in joke, like that's mm. really fun. You know, um, that's, a, that's, there's nothing, which is what comedians are always chasing. You know, they're always chasing that first laugh or that, that, you know, the last great show they had. So you, what does that do for you? What does it oh, do? Oh, man. Well, just think about how f- you, you could probably imagine how it feels to be on stage and tell a joke and no one laughs. Mm. Uh, and like, you can understand how mortifying that feels. Gut wrenching. Yeah. So, the opposite is how it feels when someone's laughing. It's like oh, wow. a real high. It's, and it's like, it's really fun. It's like a really positive. And being in the crowd laughing, like, I love watching comedy. I go to comedy shows all the time. It's like, the, it's the best feeling. Who makes you laugh? Oh, man. I laugh at. I have such a broad range of com- like I love everyone, you know, Dave Chappelle to um, Lena and Woodley to Chris Rock, Margaret, any comedian. Like I love all the different styles. Nate Bargatze, Sebastian Maniscalco, like um, you name a comedian or, or, or television show that's funny, and I'll probably enjoy it. Like oh, I, I like silly stuff, clever stuff, like whatever. Um, so who's the goat? Then? Oh, look, controversial. But I reckon Chappelle is probably, um, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I, He's my guy. He's, 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 he's brilliant. Um, you know, I think he, you know, like criticisms about like focusing on particular issues of late, but just the way that he can, t- you know, craft stories and make super yeah. clever points sound really dumb and simple. Like it's just, that's like a huge Normal. talent. Yeah, it, like he's done a lot of work pre, like I'm, I've watched this stuff and he talks about how much training he's had in like uh, drama and, oh, yeah. and acting, acting yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Have you done any of that? I've done like, um, I've done bits of acting coaching. I've been, you know, I've done some acting lessons. Um, yeah, but, um, not in the way, like he went to a, like a drama school. school yeah, yeah. 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 And he, I think he also like was really obsessed with, um, voice actors, like the guy that did, um, all the Bugs Bunny stuff and, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. which is, which kind of comes through in his work. Yes, um, yes. yeah, I used to like, me and my sister used to just in front of the mirror, pretend to be news readers when we were kids and, t- and just tell the story of the day, like in a stupid, but yeah, like impersonating, um, at, at people as a kid was something I really used to enjoy. Um, wow. but, but, um, you know, got me in a lot of trouble, Subhanallah. <laughs> making Subhanallah. fun of people. I, w- I want to touch base on, on, a, on a topic. Uh, obviously, you know, you've gone to the Palestine rallies and, oh, yeah. and I just want to talk about that. Like, you know, how, how being in com- comedy, being in your limelight, what, what happens, what happens mm. to you? You know, is there backlash? Is there support? Is there, what do you, what, what takes place? I, I, do, 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 do you think, oh, oh, I'll keep away from this? Like, you know, what? Uh, can um, I ask, sorry. Yeah, no, you can ask, of course you can ask. Um, as, a, as a Muslim that started out doing comedy or entertainment via Muslim stuff, so through Salam Cafe, my comedy that was for Muslim community stuff, people, you know, um, I'm sort of used to, it's not like I'm coming out of the closet as like a Palestine supporter. Mm. Like people have always seen or assumed that anyway, but yeah, um, it's brutal. If you um, speak out against Israel, I, um, people will blog about you, write about, you know, I got written up in the Jewish news the other day, Australian Jewish news, news for talking about like, um, you know, well-documented crimes that the Israeli defense force occupation force are committing about, you know, blindfolding civilians, stripping them down. And there have been allegations of execution, you know, and they said, oh, this is blood libel. Back when I did Salanka, uh, so when I did Legally Brown, which is my show on SBS, one of the episodes, um, I think it was like episode eight, season two. Um, so it was a stand up show that I do in studio and then it would throw to sketches and stunts. So in the studio, in front of a live audience, episode, I wore a t-shirt, it says Free Gaza, which is the one that I wore when I spoke at the rally recently. Um, same t-shirt, 
it's incredible that we're you know still in this, we're still talking about the same stuff. I wore that t-shirt and uh, no one said no. We recorded the whole thing. I was like, oh my god, amazing. Um, I haven't actually told anybody this. Um, and then um, this is now maybe eleven years ago. Anyway, uh, about a week or two later, before it had, the whole thing had gone to air, I got a call from the CEO um, saying, hey, Nazim, you know, I love the show. The season's looking great. So funny, you know, haha. Yeah, I was watching the show with some friends, actually. Yeah, I was watching the show with some Jewish friends, and they actually found your T-shirt, the free Gaza T-shirt, a little bit offensive, yeah. And I said, really? You know, it's just, just free Gaza. He goes, yeah, no, they found it quite offensive. You know, maybe, I can't remember if he said anti-Semitic or not, but he said they found it offensive. I was like, oh, you know, I, I didn't think it was a political statement. I just thought it's you know, free Gaza. It could mean, that could mean any, who doesn't want a free Gaza? Like from Hamas or from, you know, like all it is is free Gaza. Anyway, he goes, yes. Anyway, we, what we need to do, we need to just kind of get rid of it. So what they did was they spent $10,000 digitally blacking it out. So on the DVD, you'll see me with the free Gaza t-shirt. But then the broadcast, it was, it was me with a black, just a plain black t-shirt. Every frame they deleted free Gaza and they spent $10,000 dollars of taxpayer money getting rid of that like i'm like how is that a fair and at the time i was like you know i won't say anything this is not just my show now a lot of people working on it and getting paid like and you know we want to get a third season up you know never got another season but um it's but that sort of stuff you know that sort of censorship of very reasonable comments um you know it's just a constant like you just expect that at all times um so yeah uh, but i do think um you know yeah, it, it it would feel worse. As I said, I'm someone that can't be neutral. Like, uh, 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 like it would. Act, it's not. I don't know how to do passive aggressive. I don't know how to half say a position. I'll just say it, or I don't. You know, I can't hold my tongue because I don't know how to. But, um, but yeah, it. Uh, yeah, it feels. It would feel worse to not say. Imagine just imagine for the last four months not saying anything. Uh, I think people that have remained silent who are, who are upset about what they're seeing they would be eaten up inside right now. Like that would, I feel genuinely, I feel like that is a real torment for those people. So I think it's it's also another side of that coin because there's a lot of brothers and sisters who are doing a lot of stuff, but they're doing it underhandedly. Mm. Or doing it. I mean, because I've spoken to yes. brothers yeah, but, and the, but, the, but the ones yeah. that are obviously... The ones that aren't doing nothing or yeah. saying nothing is completely different comparatively. Because I'll say there's, there's submarines mm. yes. and there's warships. True. In reality. And mm. sometimes... As you know, there's a lot of submarines out there that are doing a lot of the, mm. you know, good work in regards mm. to, because they don't want to put themselves in the, yeah, like, no, no, you know, and there's that yeah. aspect. So you, you got to, because I've, I've heard those things, some brothers, and I've heard some discussions from some brothers, really mm-hmm. good brothers, and, you know, they get tormented saying, oh, you guys are not speaking out. And it's like what I do between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yeah. I, they find it more productive yeah. to do khair, yeah, you, you know, it's that way. And that's of. the other thing, like, you know, like p- people... And who are we to judge? Like God judges people on their amen, sincerity amen, and amen. their own intentions. And so long as we are, you know, answerable to our own, you know, intentions on our... Amen. Amen. And that's, amen. You know, no, I'm just, because I, I have... A, it's a tough... It's a very tough situation. But, yeah, yeah. but, but, but yeah. you have to understand something. The Muhammad Ali's, where they gave up their medals, they gave up willing to be jailed mm. because they believed mm. and wholeheartedly are the ones that really now are being mm. elevated. Yes. For the ones that didn't stand for nothing and Mm-mm. really... Mm. You know, flip and flop. Yes. It, it, yeah, and and, 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 and I, I I totally agree. Having mm. your foundations, and if that's what the way you stand, mm. and it is like this it's is a, a tough place. It's, it's a, a tough place. like, and and this is our lives, our whole lives. Life is a marathon as well. You know, we we've got to be clever. You know, advocacy isn't just like yelling as loud as you can at all times. You can't go level ten at all times. Like everybody needs to play their role. You yeah, know, yeah. I know some people who are like working on a legal case against some um, hateful, you know, r- racially, religiously discriminatory comments that have been made. Like, and that's all behind the scenes. If you went to their public social media profiles, you probably wouldn't think yeah, that they're doing exactly, anything. Yeah, exactly. You know, some mm-hmm. people are just raising money. Some people are like yeah. talking to people in Gaza and helping them with their mental health questions. So, so like... Lord. And also a lot of it, you're just making dua, and I think, yeah. you know, we've all but got mashallah, a, like, you, you have that superpower, alhamdulillah. Well. And, and alhamdulillah, <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you with that. And may Allah bless you for mm, using that, you know what I mean? Wallahi. But it's all, yeah, like, I think, you know, everybody, ha- you know, just like in society, take, we all, to, to make a community, we've, everybody's got to do something, you know. Amen, um, amen. We're not all doing the same things. So. Alhamdulillah. And, it's, and, and the, the other thing that is also, that is a, that is a complication is that, 
Palestine is one particular issue, but there is like, there are so many human rights abuses and injustices, like Uyghurs uh, yeah, right Uyghurs, now suffering. Uyghurs in, with China. You know, in Sudan, and, you know, like there's all, around the world we sort of, and I do feel like, you know, as a Sri Lankan, um, uh, when Sri Lanka had a civil war and there were Muslims and Tamils that were being genocided by a Sinhalese majority government, um, where was the rest of the community or the world? Like it's, you know, so I often feel like, yeah, we're called to, as we should stand up for Palestine, but it should be, we should kind of feel that same pain for everybody. everywhere. And, and hopefully I feel like through the prism of Palestine, we can see, um, we, we can grow in our empathy. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean um, for me too. Like I, I, to I totally, I totally agree. You know, mm, and I, we speak about the Iraq war and these mm. kind of things that took place. And a lot of us stayed silent as, as, and yeah. Muslims, yeah, where we should have really, we should have been as much as, and even, and you know, now we talk about like First Nation people in Australia understand First Nation people in Palestine, and I do feel like that's good. I hope it's not just surface level because yes. hmm. for years I would say ethnic communities in Australia have been largely racist towards Aboriginal people. Like you know, we talk about that like the yes, less than, hundred yeah, percent. Whereas actually, we hopefully we genuinely now have genuine solidarity with people who Inshallah, yeah. have had their land and lives and rights taken from them um, by an unjust colonial power. So hopefully we're starting to grow and evolve as well through Palestine. Yeah. Amen, um, amen. It does, does no, it like put a, an amazing lens on the situation. Mm. It? Alhamdulillah, Allah bless you. And oh, and you. And last but not least, Inshallah, we'll end this. What, what is success to you? Oh man, success is being on this podcast. I <laughs> <laughs> say so you haven't made it until you get here. Eh? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm you, 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 now. You, you weren't expecting. <laughs> you weren't expecting this kind of drilling. That's why you refused us no, no. this week. <laughs> oh man, no, no, you had to wait to sign that not Channel Nine contract. <laughs> I, know, I wasn't ready for the second half of my career, which is uh, all downhill. Uh, now, success uh, is for me is people coming to my comedy show. Which is <laughs> <laughs> and about that, we should uh, talk about that. Subhanallah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm yes. going on. Tour, I'm going on tour around um, uh, around Australia, New Zealand. Uh, when does this go out? Uh, inshallah, I think six weeks. Just all the places: Adelaide, oh. Canberra, Brunswick, Heads, Melbourne, Brisbane, Auckland, Perth, Gold Coast. Just basically everywhere. Inshallah. Um, some regional tours as well. So just you know, just come and see me. But otherwise, um, you know, if you see me on the street, just say hi. I like big. talking to strangers. Inshallah, Allah, Allah bless you, Allah bless you. Allah keep you yeah, steadfast, bro. Yeah, we, again, yeah. back to success. Yeah. What is success besides the something? Okay, to... success is honestly like um, uh, being healthy, being able to laugh, um, having good people around, um, you know, being on good terms with your family, uh, and just being able to have someone that you can pick up the phone and call and just and rant, you know, like having that friend. Yeah, yeah. that's valuable for me. And also being super rich. <laughs> Woo! Um, that's all gone. <laughs> a lot of cash. I love to keep you steadfast, yeah. mate. Thank you for trusting us and coming down. Thank you for trusting me. And, but but I call, look, mashallah. And, and this is this is one thing that, subhanAllah, you know, showing that you standing up for these particular, you know, sh you know, really controversial topics like Palestine. It just shows your character because the Muslim community gave it to you for, you know, Uncle Sam. <laughs> some of them. Yeah, some of them, you know, and it just shows, subhanAllah, look, you know, people don't understand how hard it is out there and how much you're doing behind the scenes. This is another thing. Muslims don't understand. Like Ted was talking about, you know, people only see, oh, I did a commercial with Red Rooster and sold mm -hmm. out. You know, you sold out, but no one knows that the stuff that you're really refusing and yeah. and keeping away and trying to keep yourself alive. Oh, man, Ted's a great, I love him. Yeah, and he's yeah. such a good comedian sure. um, and a genuine guy. I and you know, like the other thing is like everything you do in some way, you could be selling out. Like you do anything. You looked into the board of directors. One person has done something do like this. Everything is compromised, mm. you know, and was the, the there'll, there'll be a time when everything you touch is yeah. has interest or something. Like, yeah, so no. we're in that time. We're compromised yeah, hundred percent of the time. Like no, it fast. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for well, yeah, uh, being part of the Safi Bros podcast. Uh, and inshallah, we normally end each podcast by asking our guest a specific question oh. we would like you to describe yourself uh -huh. in a single concise i am statement and i'll let you think about that oh gosh but first, this is like yeah i'm married it's like a tinder <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Question it, like it, this is a tinder question so in a single concise i am statement so i am i'll let you think about it 
But we'll first, before we end, inshallah, we will thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our audience, and remind you, inshallah, to subscribe and comment. And uh, any questions, guys, inshallah, anything you want to know from our brother or about this podcast, please write down and uh, please give our audio rating, uh, a platform, audio platform a rating, please. So on that note, uh, I am statement. I am still trying to pray Fajr on time. That's, that's me. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So, Allah better you know, for you. May Allah right, keep us set fast. Allah keep our intentions uh, for His sake. And Allahumma barik. Zakallah khair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nazim. Thanks, boys.